The Volvo Car Group now starts the production of the first engine alternatives of the new highly efficient Volvo engine architecture, VEA, four-cylinder engine family. The strategy to concentrate on four-cylinder petrol and diesel engines together with electric power is the path that Volvo Cars has chosen for the future. I definitely see this as, as an historical moment for Volvo because when we decided to start the development of the VEA, we also made a very, very important strategic decision to go for four-cylinder turbo engines only and combine it with electrification. Here in Fuevde, they have built a new hyper modern factory section of 4,500 square meters and it is here that all the engine alternatives will be produced on one and the same production line, thus providing extremely efficient production. This is the single largest investment that we have since the start of this factory. Approximately 200 million euros is the total investment in this project, where the, one of the biggest investments is the factory that we are standing in, where it ranges from 30 to 40 million euros. All continued development and production of VEA will take place within the Volvo Car Group and is an important part of the company's independency strategy. Having total control of the development and production of engines and transmissions in combination with fewer engine alternatives increases flexibility and the ability to influence quality. The biggest challenge have been to, uh, to have an architecture that all engines can easily be installed in different cars with the same uh, uh, components. To meet the marketplace, we haven't delivered fuel economy, advanced levels of emissions, but at the same time we need to develop engines that deliver performance, refinement for the customer. And a way to do that is to go downsizing, downspeeding, as many others in the world are doing. And Volvo have a unique chance to do that now as we become more and more independent. During 2013, Volvo estimates producing almost 20,000 engines. And by the end of the year, production volume should be close to 2,000 engines per week. The first engine alternatives will be launched during the autumn. More than 60 years ago, Volvo developed the three-point safety belt. And today, most of us take it for granted that cars have safety belts. But as we saw at the time, it was controversial. The safety belt is an invention that has saved a million lives. But the point is, it didn't do this alone. For the technology to have this type of impact, it required behavioural change, cultural change, education and governmental regulation. Yes, Volvo's invention was the beginning, but saving those million lives, that was something we did together. Today, cars are safer than ever, but in the same way, that's not going to be enough. If we're serious about saving another million lives, which we are and we should be, then we need a new global safety movement. And the first thing it needs to acknowledge is that nobody has all the answers. This needs to be a truly global conversation. My name is Katrine Marsal, and I'll be moderating today's conversation here from Stockholm in Sweden. But our guests will be joining us from the different Volvo Cars brand stores all across the world, from Tokyo, Milan, New York and Warsaw. This is Volvo Studio Talks. So here in Stockholm, I have you, Marlin Ekholm. You are head of Volvo Cars Safety Centre. Saving another million more lives, what are the big challenges then? Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, you have to acknowledge that safety, traffic safety varies across the globe. But if we go back to the basics and really focus on getting that right, I know we have taken a huge step towards traffic safety, meaning using the safety belt in the correct way, making sure that the, your children are protected in the correct car seat for their age and size, and as important, safe speed, making sure we're driving at a safe speed. Mm. And what technological solutions are you working on at Volvo Cars at the moment? Well, on the subject of speed, as of this year, we have introduced a speed cap on all our uh, cars. Uh, of course, that not being the final answer. 
but it is an important action for us to take uh, to start talking about speed as an issue and really doing the right thing. And also the very complex conversation that it needs that we need to have on the car manufacturer's responsibility to influence people's behavior to make sure that we are driving at a safe speed. Mm -hmm. And policy certainly seems to be going in this direction as well, speaking about regulation. The EU is going to require that all new cars launched from 2022 will have to have some kind of speed limiting equipment. Would, would you go as far as to say that speed limiting technology is the new safety belt, something that we might find controversial but that our grandchildren will think is completely self-evident? Well, it, it does boil down to physics. Uh, the higher the speed, the higher the force, and the force is what hurts and potentially kills you. So yes, we need to have a speed conversation. But apart from following the road sign speed, there are other challenges. There's road friction conditions, there's weather, there's daylight. So we need to broaden the conversation on speed, making sure that we have the correct speed in whatever traffic situation we're driving. Mm. So what about distraction? There's a lot of talk about distraction and what impact that has on us as drivers. When you say that it's one of the biggest challenges, what, what exactly do you mean? Well, distraction is a form of inattention, in, um, drifting away from the task of driving. The human brain is fantastic. It can handle extremely complex situations when you're at your best. But if you are distracted, and it can be for sleep deprivation, uh, we've talked a lot about the smartphones, it can be from uh, an illness or life in general. Forgetting your anniversary can be very distracting when you're sitting in a car. So what we want to do is introduce sensors in, in our cars, sensors that are able to understand where your state of mind is. Are you focused on the driving that you need to be? or are you distracted from it? In the film here, we can see how the sensors are monitoring your eyes and your bodily movements. Not to film you, because what we want to do is understand where your state of mind is. And to, if you are distracted, how can we make you a better driver in that particular situation? Mm. So this is an example of a new technology. You mentioned the new technology around speed, but then also I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation if technology was enough, then you could just sort our problems out for us. Why is technology not enough? Well, technology is what we use to, to address the issues. But as you were mentioning in your openings, opening words, the seatbelt alone did not do it. So it's the combination of, uh, well, technology of course, but uh, cooperation, collaboration, education is super important. Because empowerment and, and knowing to, how to do the right thing and what the right thing to do is, is one of the very, very strong tools of improving traffic safety. Mm. Magnus Gjernström, you are director for Safer Vehicle and Traffic Safety Center, which is a competence center here in Sweden, working around a bold mission, which you know we know about in Sweden, but our audience across the globe might not know about, the Swedish Vision Zero. What is that? Well, I'm happy to, to describe that. And, and the essence of Vision Zero is to say that um, we should not allow anyone to be killed or seriously injured in the traffic system. So you should be able to move without being uh, being killed in your in the traffic. So that is really the the core of uh, nobody. Vision Zero. Nobody. Nobody. So that is where the zero comes from. So that is uh, nobody. Mm. And this policy is it was started in Sweden or it was instated in Sweden in 1997. So how, how has it gone? You know, 22 <laughs> years. Yes, exactly. Well, it's, uh, we, we've been successful, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, we have reduced the number of, of uh, fatalities in, in traffic. We've gone down from about 600 uh, that year, 1997, down to a bit more than 200 last year. Um, but I think the main thing in this is really the, the change of mindset. Uh, that normally you think that, okay, it's a traffic system, you have a lot of cars, trucks, buses, bicyclists and so on, you have to accept mm. that uh, some people have to, to be injured, have, some people have to, be, uh, to get killed, because that's sort of inherent in the system. Um, so that was the main thing of, of changing this uh, line of thought, that no, 
Let's do it the other way around. If we say that we will not accept this, how do we then work in order to, um, to reach that? And uh, as Marlin was saying before, the collaboration cooperation part is very, very crucial because no one can really solve this by themselves, not even the, the sort of the strongest authorities. You have to do this uh, jointly. Mm. A lot has happened since 1997. I mean, our cities and traffic was, cars were quite different in 1997. Any new particular challenges now? Absolutely. They are coming all the time. And, and, uh, and new types of vehicles. Uh, you have sort of one-wheeler, two-wheeler, three-wheelers uh, moving around. Uh, we had the electric scooters popping up from sort of nowhere um, a while ago. How do you manage this? How do you handle this in the, in the traffic situation that you have? Um, and also, uh, with the more de developed cars and, and trucks and so on, and the systems that we, we were talking about, um, how do you make sure that we maximize the benefit from that? Mm. So that is one part of the, of, the, of the situation. The other thing is that you have to deal with this from an overall sustainability perspective, and also you have to have an efficiency in, in the traffic system. So you have to have a, tra a traffic flow, and at the same time, really make sure that it is also safe. Mm. And just to emphasize to all of us and remind us how, about the seriousness of, of this challenge, how many lives are lost globally in traffic? Well, unfortunately, we lose 1.3 million lives each year. And, and that figure has been fairly stable uh, the last few years, actually. So, so there is a lot of work uh, that we need to do. And also, I think one thing to, to really point out here is that between the ages of 5 and 29, this is the main cause of death. Mm -hmm. So this is why our young people get killed. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is a stark reminder of mm -hmm. the importance, I, mm -hmm. I would say. A very stark reminder. And collaboration, nobody can do this alone. We are going to hear today from a couple of amazing private initiatives uh, and public initiatives from all over the world. And I'm going to start by going to Warsaw in Poland, where we have Paweł Krupiewski. He's an expert on child safety in cars. He's a biomechanic and a traffic safety influencer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You provide an amazing service in Poland where parents, like me, can drive in and you have 450 different car seats and parents can get advice on not just what car seat fits your car and your child, but also how to use it correctly. And this has been tremendously successful in Poland. You're a big advocate of the rear-facing child seat, but there are challenges in teaching parents and convincing parents to adopt this. What are those? Many parents still hesitate uh, about it be because they uh, haven't a knowledge. They don't know that um, uh, rear-facing car seat are five times better, safer than forward-facing. Uh, secondly, some parents have this knowledge, but they still hesitate uh, because they think and complain about hypothetical problems. Uh, for example, uh, for motion sickness, for hypothetical lack of space to the child's legs, for the lack of space to the parents, etc., etc. You are mother and you know this complaint. Uh, but what we must do, we must educate them. And we do in Fotelik Info with success. Why? Because we don't only talk about it. We are uh, giving the parents practical experience. When they come to the Fotelic Info, they spend one hour with our technician and um, our technicians show them how it works in their cars. They fit the car seat, they choose the car seat from the many of the best car seat on the market and choose the one that uh, gives the big stability, good um, angel of reclining. And when these parents uh, see it in their cars and when these parents uh, see the smile in their child's uh, face, they decide to buy it <laughs> and use it. And for surprise, for the end, they decide to be advocates of rear-facing car seat 
from zero to four years. Mm. And they tell everyone about it. That's, that's amazing what big impact that type of education can have. And speaking of, of education, apart from child seats and the importance of rear-facing, what would you say, from your experience, is the biggest thing that people need to learn when it comes to existing safety technology in cars? Many people in Poland, not only in Poland, don't know how to use it properly. Because they think that simply fasten it gives the safety. We have a video of you, how you teach someone here to use we the teach, safety belt correctly. We teach them practically because talking about it is important but not having possibility to translate the knowledge. We talking and showing good um, routing of hip uh, belt and we talking about the best position uh, in the shoulder belt uh, but we find that most of people in Poland don't using an adjuster on pillar belt. Mm. Malinia Kom, when you hear Pavel, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic what Pavel is doing. He's talking about knowledge and sharing knowledge and moving from, from talking to, to, to doing. And it's empowerment, empowering people with knowledge to do the right thing. And we're, if we're serious about getting to zero, and, and we are, these private initiatives are key in mm. making it happen. Mm. So more child safety influences in more countries. Absolutely. Yeah. So this was one very, or is one very successful private initiative, and we're now going to hear from another one. Russell Henk is a man with a surprising recipe for teaching teenagers to drive safer. And that recipe is that if you want to teach a 16-year-old to drive safer, you should ask a 17-year-old to teach her. Russell Henk, you're the program director for Teens in the Driver's Seat in Texas in the US. Good, good afternoon or good morning. Well, thanks for having me. Greetings from Texas. The sun has risen, so... The sun has I'm risen and it's a good day. So, teenagers should teach other teenagers to drive safer. Why, why does it work? Well, we have you know, decades of research that highlights the influence that adolescents, young adults can have on each other. Sometimes that's not always positive, sometimes that's negative, but we've found evidence that a peer-to-peer -peer approach can be very effective in the areas of teen pregnancy, teen smoking as examples, but no one had really leveraged that dynamic to address the leading cause of injury and death as we've spoken of here, uh, young people. So the idea is to create young safety ambassadors, safety advocates, provide them nice base resources that they can leverage that we provide from our organization, um, but, but they're the grassroots mechanisms for reaching each other and influencing each other in a positive way and kind of getting each other's backs, if you will, when they're in a situation where there's not an adult around to make that driver or a passenger even uh, make better decisions inside the vehicle. How did you come up with this idea? I mean, you mentioned the research has been around, but to actually take it, apply it to driving and road safety and, and, and do this. Well, unfortunately, the catalyst for me um, taking this initiative up was a horrible rash of fatal crashes that we experienced in San Antonio, Texas, which was home for me at the time. We lost 10 teenagers over a six-week period in four separate crashes. It was all over the news. I had two young children of my own. I was literally making, it was making me sick to my stomach. I, I felt I needed to do something. And what I was watching play out in the media and in the community was really more of the same. And I wanted to find a way, you know, to pick up again on some of the comments that have been made, is a way to activate, motivate, and empower young people as a part of the solution. And from this extensive experience that you have, what would you say are the sort of the main safety challenges specific to, to young drivers? Well, the top risks that we really focus on, again, and provide lots of outreach materials to the, the teens, the young people, uh, we've touched on a couple of those. Speeding, distracted driving are a couple of those, not just the smartphone, 
but other young people in the vehicle without an adult is a very uh, risky situation and increases their probability of being in a crash dramatically. Um, we've got the low seatbelt use, young people, again back to the invincibility uh, mindset that a lot of them have. So low seatbelt use with that age group, um, drowsy driving, we touched on that, and then of course impaired driving from alcohol and drugs. Those are all part of our message platform and what we help provide them ways um, to communicate that to one another to really improve not so much to teach them driving skills but to enhance their situational awareness. Mm. Marlene Ekholm, you have two teenagers at home. Do they? Do you feel that they listen to you when you come home with your research from Volvo Car Safety Center and preach about the importance of safe driving or would you rather have Russell Henk send over one of his teenagers to your house? Well, it, it does resonate very well with, with my own personal experience, as you're saying. Um, usually there are windows of opportunity when you're curious about traffic safety and children are all, always open and curious to learn things. Um, new parents are also very, very curious, but as, you, as you're touching on, teenager, teenagers are not so curious to learn from parents uh, about why and what to do in traffic. So. Russell's initiative has created a window that is normally closed and I find that admirable and him sharing that today I hope inspires more to do the same. Mm. And we're now going to go to Milan, Italy to a project, the Icarus project that does just this. It started in Italy and it's now an EU funded project. We are joined by Officer Federica Deleda. She is Executive Officer of the Italian State Police and the head of the Provincial Traffic Police section of Cremona. Icarus, why, what do you do and why does it work? Good afternoon to everybody. Um, we think that uh, speaking to young people is a very important preventive measure but uh, we need uh, to speak their language. Uh, so we tried uh, to reach this aim with the project ICARO, uh, which is a way to make children and young people understand that respecting the rules allows them to have fun while protecting their lives. Each year, the uh, ICARO project deals uh, with a specific theme of road safety. For example, driving under the influence uh, or distraction, respecting the rules uh, or uh, respecting for uh, vulnerable users, uh, space sharing on the roads. Uh, and uh, it is adapted for various age, uh, um, uh, different ages. So uh, every year, um, there is a, a different contest and the winners are um, uh, awarded in, a, in an official uh, ceremony. A research by La Sapienza University uh, has been run uh, about uh, the ICARO project which uh, certified the effectiveness of the project. And uh, thanks uh, to the, uh, this uh, research, uh, a lot of uh, uh, young people um, have been tested and uh, an essay has been published. And uh, in this essay, um, uh, the uh, psychologists of uh, La Sapienza University have uh, focused uh, an important uh, uh, concept, uh, which is the paradox of the young uh, driver. The paradox of the young driver uh, says that uh, every time an inexperienced driver uh, acts imprudently uh, without paying the consequences of uh, his acting, uh, he becomes more convinced that uh, he is immune to risk. So the issue is uh, to intervene before he becomes another road fatality. Mm. So the paradox of the young driver, the belief that, that yeah, you are invincible. 
Officer Deleda was speaking about the importance of not just teaching children the highway code and the rules, but really teaching them, you know, to make proper decisions and the reasons why the rules are there. And we're now going to speak to Tokyo in Japan, and because our next guest has a surprising recipe to make kids do just this, and the recipe is play. Welcome to Mie Shimize. You're a child educator who does planning and development at the Play to Learn Experience Center Kidzania in Tokyo. And um, she has, you have created a play program for children and adults on road safety. Why is play an important tool when educating children about safety? For children, running and playing are synonymous. Running, that is being able to experience, know and do new things is the most important play for children. By experiencing curiosity through play and in a situation where mistakes are okay, it will become better instilled into the children and it will be highly effective as a learning experience. In Japan, people are, you tell me, in general, very good at following traffic rules. Why is that not always enough? Many people in Japan follow traffic rules, and the reason why they follow is only because rules. In particular, Japanese societies are strict about observing social rules, so they often just follow them without thinking about why the rules are necessary. However, I want children living in the future to be more motivated to improve the social in which they live. Similarly, regarding traffic rules, I think it is necessary to follow the rules with a sense of purpose to protect the safety of yourself and those around you. So this is a very, very successful initiative in, in Japan and focused, as some of the other initiatives we've heard about today, on children. Marlene Ekholm, I know you've talked previously about that the importance of reaching children with this message and this education is not just to keep them safe, which obviously we all want, but it's also because children are really good influencers. Well, again, from personal experience, I know that children are very, very good at, well, first of all, as, as we just heard, wanting to understand the why. And they keep asking until they understand the why. And then they will challenge us as parents and adults. And they will remind us. So children are very good to make us change our behavior, which is key because the big message, one of the big messages here so far has really been that technology is not enough and that the technology exists doesn't mean that we will change our behavior in a way that this technology will actually have the effect we want it to have.